Hi, I'm Jennifer DeLazana. I'm a writer, an editor, and an online instructor. It's great to be part of the Writers Workout Conference, and I hope you're all learning a lot and having fun. Right now, we're going to talk about the best way to handle using technical terms in your writing. You might be surprised at how much writing includes technical terms, and you might even be surprised at what constitutes a technical term. Why should you listen to me? Well, I have a lot of experience using technical terms in my writing. My very first writing job was as a columnist for a gun magazine, but I have spent more than 30 years working, writing, editing, and teaching in the allied health medical field. I have some strange degrees, but it's a mix of pure academia and that fun MFA in writing popular fiction. My first published book last year uh, was a book about the music industry. I teach classes in medical coding, medical transcription, electronic health records, medical writing, and my current favorite is keys to effective editing. Recently, I moved to the New York City area with my daughter who just turned 20, so we can see if she can make it on Broadway. So now I'm learning all about that industry. When she doesn't need me here, I'm going to begin a real journey as a digital nomad. So as you can see, my life takes me in some strange directions, but it's never boring and all of it informs my writing and editing. So let's get into it. Sometimes we need to use technical terms in our writing. There's no way around it. That's the name of the thing that we're talking about. But sometimes those terms can be wielded like a weapon. A technical term that is unfamiliar to your audience and used only to make you sound smarter or more important than you are because you're purposely obscuring the meaning or just refusing to identify that it needs clarity that's jargon. So a technical term written in a way that elevates your writing and the understanding of your audience is one of the reasons we write. Jargon is often kind of trash and the same words can be either one. The words I have here are terms that were originally used among people working in specific industries that have worked their way into our everyday language. Of course, uh, cash is a word that can be used to mean simply a hidden collection of items, but in computer architecture, it is a place that stores data so it can be accessed faster. I'm sure if you've ever had trouble with getting to a specific website that may have undergone changes, you've been told to clear your cache. It's a function of everyday life now. Stat is a medical term meaning now or as quickly as possible. Of course, the other version of this is ASAP, ASAP, which comes from the military. Of course it does, because it's an acronym. Not that the medical profession doesn't have its share of acronyms, uh, but ASAP has also creeped into our language. Due diligence is also a rather old phrase, 15th century but it came to be used in modern business and legal fields to mean the research done to make sure a person, business or transaction is sort of on the up and up or worth the money that's going to be invested. And we're all, we all kind of use it that way now. Um, AWOL is another term from the military. It means absent without leave and refers to somebody who has not asked permission to be away from their assigned area. Most people use this to mean somebody who has left without letting anybody know where they went. So very similar. It is likely that almost any document you write with any of these terms in it would not need a further explanation. They are technical terms, but they have become part of our common lexicon. But there are plenty of terms that aren't as easy to decipher. In 1946, George Orwell published an essay called Politics and the English Language. In it, he argues that the English language is devolving and it's affecting our politics, uh, or politics is affecting the language. I'm unsure of which comes first, really. It's one of those essays that seems strangely modern in some ways. It just goes to show you that some things really don't change much. 
I highly recommend reading it. I've put a link to it in the references at the end. Uh, in it, he takes a Bible verse from the book of Ecclesiastes and writes it in the way he thinks modern English would do it. So from, from the Bible, it says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. And here it is in Orwell's modern English. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. Now, even he makes sure we know that this is parody. But the point is, when the wording of something is harder to understand than the King James Version of the Bible, you're probably going to need a rewrite. You can see that, taken on their own, we know that what those words mean. They're, they're not even really technical terms. But putting them together in this way makes it a dense wall of meaninglessness. One of the dangers of being in a profession that uses technical terms or even language like this is that these phrases come naturally to you. They make sense to you and probably to those in the same profession. Putting aside the gobbledygook of the last slide, necessary technical terms often convey so much more than the words themselves because they are stand-ins for whole concepts. For instance, somebody who works in an industry that uses any of these words has a deep understanding of what goes on sort of behind the scenes of those words. They have a great big picture in their heads when these words are used. But people who aren't in those industries only need a brief overview of what they mean that will give them something to go on to get meaning from the work they appear in. Of course, it won't convey the entirety of the term, but it will be enough to ground them in the meaning of what we're trying to say. So let's take a term from biology, the Krebs cycle. It's a complicated process of how our cells make energy from food. Does every mention of the Krebs cycle have to come with a diagram and specifics about how it happens? Even if the reader has never heard of the Krebs cycle before, if you're not actually writing a paper about how the Krebs cycle works, all you have to say is that it's a process that describes how our cells make energy from food and keep moving. Now, how you do it may look different if you're writing nonfiction or fiction. Don't think that there's fiction that can mention the Krebs cycle? Sure there is. In fact, there's even a children's book, How Gary Glucose Became ATP, A Journey into the Krebs Cycle, uh, which does not need a, an apostrophe, actually. Um, as I said, I'm not sure if Orwell is saying in his essay that politics is causing the bad language or if bad language is causing bad politics. But whichever is true, he does believe fixing the language can fix the politics. It might well be said that anybody who is a writer believes that. Um, you'd have to do your own reading of the essay in order to decide for yourself whether you agree with Orwell. But I think we're all at least vaguely familiar with a few of these quote unquote rules for writing that Orwell posited in his essay. I didn't know before writing this talk that this essay is where they came from. But you can see number five is pretty important to our topic today. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. Now, you'll see I won't go so far as to say that you should never use one when an everyday equivalent will do. But I will say that we need to know when to use them, when not to use them, and how to make them understandable when we do use them. The first rule of writing with any technical language is to know your audience. It's better to write at a lower level than maybe some members of your audience. Uh, 
than to write above the heads of any members of your audience. As long as you keep the information interesting, the people who have a higher knowledge of your field are not going to miss the higher level technical words as long as the concepts are correct. This applies to nonfiction more than fiction. Um, in fiction, you're going to have an age target most often more than anything, but things should generally be kept as non-technical as possible. There are exceptions, of course, don't forget Gary Glucose, but when you're writing nonfiction, you really do have to have a good idea of who you're talking to when deciding what to explain and not to explain. This slide is from the site plainlanguage.gov, which includes a style guide for government writers so they can write things for the public that everybody will understand. I know, I know, it's a little bit ironic, but it's actually a really great site. I suppose it's just a matter of getting those government writers to actually follow it. Does Congress know about it? I don't know. So they have these examples of what they consider jargon and what to say instead. But keep in mind, if you're talking to a group of doctors, let's get more specific, pulmonologists, doctors who treat lung conditions, about advances in respiratory therapy, you probably are going to say positive pressure ventilatory support. Everybody will know what you're talking about in that audience, and there are actually negative pressure ventilators. You do wanna be very specific in this case. Let's say that instead of addressing pulmonologists though, you're writing a handbook for hospital volunteers about things they need to be careful of while they're seeing patients. Warning them to be careful around the positive pressure ventilatory machines is unnecessary. You can use respirators instead. In this piece of an article I wrote about breakthroughs in the treatment and prevention of cancer, um, in Plexus Magazine in 2018, I use one method of explaining the technical term HPV. This magazine is for members of the Association for Healthcare Documentation Integrity. It's a trade organization for people who are healthcare documentation specialists. You may know the term medical transcriptionist better. But there are other types of clinical documentation jobs represented by the organization also. So these are not Generally, doctors or nurses, but people reading this magazine are well versed in medical terminology and have a lot of clinical knowledge to support the professionals they work with. However, the range of knowledge is pretty wide from students of healthcare documentation to department supervisors with decades of experience. You can see in the last sentence, it's a pretty long sentence that might have benefited from a little more editing. I say an example of this would be the HPV vaccine. Here's a technical term, and we're calling it by its usual clinical name, but it's an init initialism. So in the next part, I say, which protects against many strains of the human papillomavirus infection? Do you see that human papillomavirus translates to HPV? It's true that the P and the V are in that same compound word, but that happens a lot in medicine, and it will make sense to the intended audience. The last part of the sentence brings us back to the point of the sentence that HPV is the cause of several types of cancer. <clears throat> With this example from a few years earlier, I took the approach of defining a number of the terms that I would be using often throughout the article right up front. This makes the beginning a bit drier, but it is effective in getting some concepts into the mind of the reader immediately so you can talk about them smoothly later on. And because it's a bit of a slog to get through all those definitions right away, you do what you can to make it a little more palatable to the reader. So you can make the topic more relatable by appealing to this common condition. The reader could have some familiarity with GERD already, G-E-R-D, because they, they or somebody they know has probably had it. That is usually enough to get somebody to read something. But there are other ways to draw somebody into a work that starts this way. You could relate a story about a person who has this or call on them to use their imagination. Imagine you had whatever. Make it short though. 
because you need to get to, in this case, a complicated clinical discussion, and you don't want to bury all those definitions you have to get through. You'll see again in this article that some of the terms that aren't defined or made less technical are ones you'd have to do that for if you were writing for a non-clinical audience. You'll see that this also shows you how to handle acronyms or initialisms. Um, you use the term, you put the shortened form after the term in parentheses, and then only use the shortened form throughout the rest of the work for the most part. Um, you see in this snip of the article that I don't fall back to using BE for Barrett's esophagus. It's just that it's not usually called BE by most clinicians. It's most often shorthanded, shortened to just Barrett's by providers. But I do use the BE later in the article as shorthand for the condition, so it is valid to use the initials here on the first page. One more example, but from a different industry, I wrote this book, which came out last year with Rich Redmond. Um, he's country music star Jason Aldean's drummer. It's a book about making it in country music. So how technical could it be? Well, you'd be surprised. Uh, but we wanted to keep it light and readable, even for people who weren't musicians, because there's enough in there about country music in general that's interesting to just fans of the genre. So it was a pretty tight line to walk sometimes. In the first clip, you can see that we italicized the words we thought might be unfamiliar as a little hint that what follows will define those terms. Then we put more common terms in quotation marks. For that first one, it's the word mixed, because most people who know anything about music are familiar with that phrase of mixing tracks to get a final composition. And we have further emphasized what that means by any uh, for anybody who may not know by adding the word combined before it in uh, in the description. In the next one, you can see that method used again to define what a mastering engineer does. And in the final one, we take the idea, an idea we had demonstrated earlier in the chapter in our description of song pluggers, and we ask the reader now to apply that concept in a slightly different way. If you're going to use technical terms, make sure you're using them consistently throughout the document and that you know precisely how they should be used. And if your reader won't know the term, you'll have to find some way, some other way to define it within the work, preferably without saying something like Webster's defines. But if there is a plain language equivalent and the actual term is not important to understanding the work, then that might be a better choice than the technical term. If the term is important and there is a plain language equivalent, use them in conjunction to get across the meaning without using a definition in your document. That way you have increased the knowledge of your audience for those who didn't know the term and you have confirmed to those who did that you know what you're talking about. Above all, make sure the term is meaningful to the context and the purpose of your work. Don't just use a term to use it. It has to further the understanding of the material. And yes, I'm sure I've started a speech with Webster's Defines <laughs> at some point, but Conan is absolutely right here. Okay, fiction. In 2017, a study was printed in the academic journal English for Specific Purposes, which investigated whether reading science fiction novels could be a resource for scientific language learning in second language learners who were intending to study the sciences. The idea was that learning the words associated with the science in the context of a story that was pleasurable to read could help students actually learn the language of science. The study looked at the number of scientific words found in general fiction versus science fiction and the number of words found in science fiction versus academic texts. They found that there were 46% more science words found in science fiction than in general fiction, 
Of course, there are 70% fewer science words in science fiction than in academic texts. But because of the greater comprehensibility of fiction than academic texts, this is a great resource for these students. Now, as I'm sure you've guessed, it's not only science fiction that has technical terms in it, but you'll see some of the same methods used to handle terms in fiction as you'll see in nonfiction. But obviously you'll have to keep the story going around the definition. You can't just take a paragraph to define the terms you'll use later. In some cases, you may have to make to separate the definition by a line or two, and you, but you still have to make that determination about the knowledge level of your audience. Without Sanction is a military thriller by Don Bentley, and in this scene, we see the use of the initialism WMD. It's pretty safe to say that fans of this type of book are going to know that WMD stands for Weapons of Mass Destruction, and you'll see it's not spelled out here anywhere in the paragraph. But let's read this. Good, Beverly said, her diction precise and clipped, that of a doctoral candidate defending her thesis. Because the final paragraph of this finding directs my agency to make discovering and assessing rogue chemical weapon laboratories our top priority. With this in mind, I leveraged all of my assets, including agency paramilitary teams, to ascertain the state of WMD programs within Syria. You see, she mentions WMD at the end of the sentence. Then the next paragraph, which you'll notice is still her speaking since there's no end of the quotation mark here, and it, it does have an end quotation mark at the end of the next paragraph, it mentions that a terrorist splinter cell was developing a chemical weapon, but that still doesn't really address what a WMD is. But wait, the last sentence here says it. It's a weapon they intended to use in a spectacular attack, possibly against a Western target a weapon intended to be used in a spectacular attack. That's absolutely the definition of a WMD for anybody who read it, but maybe didn't remember, or didn't quite get what it was. Even though he doesn't come right out and say it, Don has made it clear that a WMD is a huge, powerful weapon. There are some times in fiction when we want jargon. Speculative fiction, which includes science fiction, but also fantasy and horror, is often where you'll see it used to good effect. If you're creating a world that's different than our world, you'll have words that are used differently than we use them or entirely made up words. In these cases, it's important because you're building your world and you want your readers to be part of that in-group that knows what this terminology means. But you still have to be careful to build it in such a way that you don't lose the readers as you're creating. You still have to ease them into the world before you just start tossing that terminology around. That means introducing terms the same way you'd introduce specialized terms in a nonfiction document, although with a touch more creativity thrown in. You can see the world building going on in Maria V. Snyder's novel, Navigating the Stars. And you can tell even from these little snippets that the narrator is a teenager. So here we're introduced to the name of their sort of internet, quantum net, and it's shorthand QNet right there surrounded by M dashes. It reads much the way the narrator would speak. In the second snippet, she elaborates on kind of how the QNet works. So we're really starting to develop even more of an understanding of this technology, which in 2024 doesn't even exist yet. And we have a mention at the end of that future word they'll have for hacking, worming. We'll see if that comes true. Uh, the words we use every day define our surroundings. They are important to our worldview, our philosophies about life, and yes, to less mundane things like our jobs and how we spend our free time. This is why dictionaries evolve. They are not a prescription for how to communicate. They are a reflection of how we are currently using language. In a story, though, it's important to limit the use of technical words because a little goes a long way in painting a picture. This also goes for using words from another language in your book, whether made up language or a real language that is other than the one your book is written in. Yes, the definition of technical terms can be stretched to using words from other languages in your stories. 
If you do this, you'll have to translate them for readers, but you can't just put the meaning in parentheses or something like that. If we assume we're writing in English, you'll use the foreign word, usually in dialogue, and then in another part of the sentence or the next sentence, use the English word. It has to be close, so the context and the purpose of the translation is not lost. In this first one from Kiss Me Catalina by Priscilla Oliveres, it's Catalina Capuleta is exactly what you need, Alberto added. Maybe she can shake some sense into you, ha, huh, Jefe? Patricio rolled his eyes at Alberto's subtext riddled jab and shameless needling by referring to him as boss, a tongue-in-cheek moniker at best. You can see in this one that the Spanish word is in the dialogue, and the action and internal monologue is where we get the translation. Jefe means boss. For the next one, from Island Affair, I'm going to go slow because my Spanish doesn't come out very smoothly sometimes. Mama Alicia's voice wormed its way through Sarah's head, a stern warning dampening her glee. Cuidado con lo que pides. Si, sí, Mama Alicia, Sarah silently promised she'd be careful what she wished for. But this was a prayer answered. No way could she be anything but thankful that she'd crossed paths with Louis Navarro. For this one, all of it is internal monologue. The full sentence is something Sarah is remembering that Mama Alicia said, and she's promising Alicia in her own thoughts that she will be careful what she wishes for, which is what the sentence in Spanish means. Do you also see that the C is not translated here? This is a common enough word now for most people, even in English speaking countries. We all know it means yes. Even if you didn't, you could really get it from its surrounding context that she was agreeing and confirming that she had listened to Alicia's warning. A word about italics for foreign language words. It's generally been the rule of thumb to use italics for foreign words that are not used widely in English. However, there is some general movement to abolish that rule as using italics can be seen as othering, treating another group of people as inherently different from you. Basically, if the story will be published, it will be in the house style that trumps whatever you may have decided for your story. Um, there will generally be an opinion about that in the style guide used by the publisher and you don't really have a say in how they handle it. You'll see that Priscilla's publisher does italic italicize the Spanish words in Island Affair, but the one in Kiss Me Catalina is not italicized. Of note, they're different publishers. Also of note, Island Affair was published in 2020 and Kiss Me Catalina was published in 2022. So it's hard to say which one is responsible for the difference. Um, which makes now a good time to mention that if you're using a technical term, include foreign language, uh, including foreign languages in your book, make sure you're current on how they're handled, as well as making sure your use is accurate. As with technical words, there's a fine line between uh, giving your story the flavor of a character from another country with another language and overloading your work with unnecessary words in another language. Again, a little goes a long way. There are actually very few in Erin Lidikin's book, The Lost Daughters of Ukraine. And unlike with something like acronyms in nonfiction, every time a foreign word is used, even if it's the same word, you'll have to clue the reader in to the translated word, unless it's a very common foreign word for English speakers to know, like hola or hors d'oeuvre. Um, that's why you can't really do it too much. You can't do the translation in the same way every time, and even the most elegantly handled translation gets boring after a while. Another note on using foreign language words, if you're not a fluent or native speaker of the other language, make sure you get somebody to read it who is done well. Using foreign languages in your fiction can help with characterization, point out worldview, reinforce a sense of place, and make your characters more authentic and relatable. Not done well can lead a reader to throw your book against the wall, and we want to avoid that. Uh, so if the word doesn't do any of the work it should be doing, just don't use it, stick to the English instead. 
Remember, a book written in English with a few foreign words added to provide flavor is meant for an English speaking audience. Most people read for pleasure in their native languages. So maybe the person reading knows both languages, but they're comfortable reading mainly in English. If they weren't, they'd read the book in the other language. So your book isn't going to appeal to an audience of people who mainly speak the other language. You have to assume most of the audience will not be bilingual and will need the translations of the words you're using. Another decision will have to be made if you're using foreign words that use a different alphabet. Most often the words are transliterated to use the English alphabet or phoneticized, although some languages have a way of writing them with the Roman alphabet, which is the one we use for English. Um, these are all things to consider when working with foreign languages in your work. This is the case for Aaron's book. The one in the first example, Horilka, is the Ukrainian drink. So, of course, it uses the Cyrillic alphabet if written in Ukrainian. And yet, is yes, it's basically vodka. Um, but there are so many different kinds. The second example, though, the Ostarbeiters, is a German word. And German is written with a Roman alphabet. Um, so, Budmo, that's the Ukrainian equivalent for cheers. I hope this will help you craft some clear, concise, and fascinating works of fiction and nonfiction. Um, as I noted earlier, here's a page of references. Some of them I used in the talk itself, and some are just more interesting information about the topic. Here is my email address. If you have any questions you haven't had answered, my website and all the places you can find me on social media. That last line is a site where you can go sign up for my newsletter. It's called Beats, and my co-author Rich Redmond and I sent it out, send it out every other week. It's not only about country music though. It's really uh, us finding all kinds of advice and inspiration for anybody who's living a creative life. Uh, my biggest compliment compliment about it is from my best friend who I know really only signed up after I started it because she loves me. Uh, she told me a couple weeks ago, completely unprompted, I promise, I really love reading your newsletter. So hopefully I'm doing something right. Thank you so much for joining me for this presentation. I had a lot of fun putting it together for you.